So welcome to the next week where we talk about parables. And the parable we're looking at today is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, just to give you some context, the Pharisees were the guys that thought they were the ones that were blessed, the elect, the ones that were select, the ones that did everything that was right, and the ones that would always be blessed by God, whose salvation was secure. They were the ones that had a tendency to look down on others. The taxpayer, tax collector was exactly the opposite. The tax collector was a man who needed the work and the work that he got was not exactly the most exciting work. It was trying to tap up people for taxes for the Romans. Yep, he was working for the occupied powers. He was actually getting the money uh, in to pay for the occupiers' lifestyles. He was not popular. And the story goes that Jesus was looking at people who thought that they were somehow better than the rest, somehow were above and beyond, somehow had that extra whatever it is that the others didn't have. You know, the ones with the biggest Bibles, the ones with the best suits, the ones that always had the best seats, the ones that sat at the front to look the greatest. And the story goes that these two guys turn up to the temple at the same time. I suppose the closest we've got is to go to church these days. And here we are, this is actually uh, Kirkbride, named after St. Bridget. Uh, just to give you a bit of a history, the island was, Christianity was brought to the island by Patrick and in the best traditions of the saints, Celtic saints, he brought 12 people with him. 12 disciples and those disciples went on to found the 12 original parishes of the island each named after them and there's been some chopping and changing and some have changed names and some haven't but Bridget or Brisha as we would call her and uh, if you look behind me there there she is to my right sorry my left your right in the stained glass window Brisha is famous in Ireland as a saint. She was certainly one of the more famous saints of old. And this is Kirkbride. Anyway, to go to our story, the two men arrive at church. They come through the door. They see the people in the church already there, the pews all filling up. And the, tax, the Pharisee goes, right, I go up to the front because I am important. I will say hi to the people to my left. I'll say hi to the people to my right. They will see me. They will know how important I am. And as I go forward, I will look at, at ahead of me and I will make sure I get the front pew so that I am right up at the very, very front, right near the altar at the top. Now, little known secret, I used to be a choir boy. And um, as you don't know, uh, choirs are always far more important than posh people because we used to sit there and the posh people had to sit there. So we were far closer to the front. Anyway, the Pharisee goes up to the front and he's probably met and greeted by everybody that knows him, that wants to be seen to know him, shaking hands and they are nodding and he's nodding back and saying how important he is and then acknowledging that he is important and God loves him because obviously he is important. And he stands at the front and he prays out loud probably, thank you Lord that I am not like other people. I pay my 10%. I turn up and I pray regularly. I follow the laws. I am not like other people. I am blessed by you because I follow you fully and um, above all, I am the man. And look at me, people. I am the example you should follow. Just look at me that I can actually stay 
in pride that I do everything that is right. We have people like that today, people who like to be seen, people who like to be at the front. I like to be at the front because I'm slightly going deaf um, and it's easier to see what's going on, not for any other particular reason. And uh, if you know Manx churches, they tend to fill up from the back forward anyway. They don't fill up from the forward backwards. So it does seem to be a bit of a mentality here that we don't put ourselves forward. It's far better to be at the back pew and then to be asked and invited to come forward to the front than it is to be at the front pew and asked to move backwards for someone who is more important. That's a completely different story. So I've told you the first half of the parable and I just wanted to say something. I think the message in this is actually, what is our attitude? Does our attitude, do we have an attitude of gratitude for the things that we actually have? Yes, the Pharisee had everything. Yes, the Pharisee was popular. And yes, the Pharisee could actually go to the front. But actually, what was his attitude towards being able to do that? He could have said, thank you, Lord God, for everything that you've given me, for the blessings that you have given me for the amount that you have put my way for me to manage to me to look after. Yes, Lord, you have blessed me beyond all measure. And for that, I am most humbly and thankfully and grateful. And you are God of God, Lord of Lords, very God of very God. But no, he has to compare himself to the man at the back. So we'll go back again down the church to where the tax collector would have sat. Now, Bride is only a small church. Some of the bigger churches would have west galleries. They would have places where people could squeeze in at the back. And down at the back here, there was always extra space. There was the standing room for those maybe who came late or those maybe who didn't want to be seen or those people who just snuck in quietly and didn't want to be known. Yep, all that distance away from the high hegens, from the people who are popular, the people that are well known. And that is where the taxpayer sat. And the taxpayer looked up to the front and the taxpayer thought of all that he had done and all that he had been given. And he didn't look up and praise God. He hung his head in shame and he said, Lord, forgive me everything that I have done wrong. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given me, that you have blessed me with. And Lord, make me a better man. Make me somebody worthy of following you. Or to put it in Christian terms, somebody who was prepared to surrender all to Christ, where he found himself. Not up at the front, with all the jewels, with all the fancy suit, with all the material wealth and all the prestige that goes with it but sitting at the back with the poor people, the people that people didn't regard with any particular favour. You know who they are. His attitude was an attitude of seeking forgiveness. It was an attitude of seeking God's face. It was an attitude of thanking the Lord for what he had been given. And that was a very, very different attitude. And then Jesus says, to finish the story off, who went home blessed? The man at the front had been blessed by people. They had all shown, said how wonderful he was. They'd all acknowledged how spiritual he was, 
how learned he was, how gifted he was, how generous he was with his gifts and tithes. The tax collector went off home and had been been forgiven and been forgiven far more, not because there was more to forgive, but because he sought forgiveness. He sought God's face in what he wanted and where he was. He wanted desperately to be in God's good favour. And he knew that everything came from God and everything goes back to God. We have an amazing situation. We have the amazing opportunity to give everything to Christ. And the bizarre thing is, we have a choice. We can be servants or slaves, if you want to use the right word for it, to modern culture, the desire to wear the right clothes, the desire to be seen in the right places, the desire to drive the right cars, the desire to be lauded as being fantastic and brilliant in our language, in our giving, in our abilities. But actually, the bottom line is, Jesus Christ died for all of us. In heaven, there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, we are all equal under Christ. Or to quote C.S. Lewis, we are all sons of Adam, we are all daughters of Eve. We are all equal before God. And because of that, it doesn't matter how great our sins were or how little our sins were, they're still sins. One of the images that was given was an image of archery. If I fire an arrow and I don't hit the bullseye, I have not hit the bullseye. If I miss and I'm in the ring around the bullseye, I have still missed the bullseye. If my arrow goes wide and flies over the target, I have still missed the bullseye. All have sinned. All have missed. And by giving our lives to Christ... He forgives us all our sins, no matter how big or small we think they are. There is nothing impossible in Christ. And he will open his arms to us. And if we follow him and surrender all to him, we get a freedom that is unbelievable. We are no longer slaves to the modern world. We are no longer slaves to culture. We are no longer slaves to the whims of fortune, to the attitudes of our friends, our so-called friends. We don't have to earn respect. We don't have to look for plaudits. We don't have to look for hundreds and thousands of likes on any posts that we do on social media. We need to look at our attitudes to what we've been given. Do we have that attitude of gratitude? There's an old hymn that starts off, count your blessings, name them one by one. It sounds a bit glib, But when was the last time you actually stopped and thought, how have I been blessed? To start, there is air that I can breathe and it's clean air. I live on an island where we can leave the doors of our houses unlocked if we forget, which I know I shouldn't be saying that, but once or twice. We can go down the streets without worrying about being mugged. We have a legal system that works. We see justice being done. We have judges that act fairly. We have a taxation system that seems to be fair. But we love to whinge about everything. And yet we have a brand new ferry that people are complaining about, and yet it looks fantastic. We have roads, and yes, they're potholed, but there are countries where they don't even have tarmac on their roads. And if we think those are potholes, You want to go across to some other places where they really do have potholes. We complain about corruption sometimes in government. But to be perfectly honest, it's probably not corruption, more incompetence and cover-up, if I'm going to say anything. But actually, more importantly than that, it's not real corruption. We are nowhere near anything that anybody else has. We complain about the choice of food in the supermarkets. But we have choice. Some places don't. 
we complain about what's on television, and yet we have thousands and thousands of channels and streaming services. We complain about internet service because it drops out a little bit now and again. There are some places in the world where they don't have even phones, they have to still use pens and papers, and some of them can't even read and write. We do not realize how much we have at times. We need to count our blessings. And we start off with the air that we breathe, the clothes that we have on our back, the food that we have on the table, the family that we have around us. Yeah, we could swing for them at times, but we love them. And we have to remember the good things, the good times, the friends that we have around us, those who support us in times of crisis, those that we can turn to. For the fact that we do have so much choice and that we have the freedom to choose. We have the choice to actually go somewhere and be somewhere. Nobody forces you to go to church. Nobody forces you to spend time with Christ. It is all you and you are free to do it. You're free to read the Bible. You are free to ask questions. You are free to disagree with other people without falling out with other pe people. You can love others as Jesus Christ loved you. So just at the end of this, what is your attitude? Thank you. Mm -hmm.